Roll it. Hi, this is Alonzo Bowden. I want to welcome you to episode 338 of my podcast, Who's Paying Attention? I'm going to say happy holidays to everybody, whatever you celebrate. We're going to get into that on this podcast. We will discuss the war on Christmas because, as you know, Christmas is always under attack this time of year. And I want to get right to my guests because I have someone who, let me see, is the word celeb? No, the word isn't celebrity. The word is icon. This woman is an icon here in Los Angeles. She has been covering Los Angeles in print and radio for I don't know how long. I believe it's 41 years is what I read. Uh, I just I will just tell you this award winning radio show. She is the one who introduced me to radio back when we had a show called Comedy Congress where we would get together every week and make fun of politicians. What could be more fun than that? And. She has become an L.A. historian, maybe the L.A. historian. There's been a series of articles in the L.A. Times, and I am learning the history of L.A. most recently about our department stores. And look it up, kids. We used to have department stores. That's how we used to buy stuff. I could go on and on, but I'm just going to get into the introduction. And the lady wears hats. Can I mention the hats? Because she is known for the hats. (laughs) Pat Morrison. Hello, Pat. Alonzo, if I started you on your radio career, I'm thrilled <laughs> to think of that. That's going to the top of the resume. That was a, that was a fantastic show. It, we, can you t- talk to the people about the idea between behind Comedy Congress and what we got to do? Because that was really fun. What we created was an opportunity for comedians like you to come on every week, and we packaged together thematically like stupid things that politicians and public figures had said. <laughs> And so we had one part of the show that was about the Second Amendment and another part of the show that was the foot and mouth disease (laughs) uh, part. And then we just cut you guys loose and you riffed on it. And we had a live audience which went crazy for this. And it was exciting because you learned about the news at the same time you were knocking the news. It was a great show and it was a lot of fun. It was myself, Ben Glebe, and Greg Proop. So I guess we were the main ones and other comedians would come on. But you you lead right into a topic that I wanted to talk about because you did. Every week you had clips of Congress people saying something ridiculous, something, you know, idiotic. Now we, we're dealing with that now and, and I'm just using this as an example. Thanksgiving, uh, um, Ted Cruz tries to make fun of President Biden for going home for the holiday, saying he's supposed to be at work. The same Ted Cruz who ran out when Texas was freezing was was headed to Cancun. There was so, your toughest job on the show had to be finding which clips you wanted to use because there's so many idiotic things said. It's true, the competition was, was difficult. <laughs> Do these Congress people, senators, politicians, not understand that the internet is forever and we we heard you we remember like what what is that i'm thinking back to the early days of television and i was not there no <laughs> <laughs> that that there was a senator a member of congress who made some remark to a reporter and they put it on the air that night and then he said he'd been misquoted you watched his lips <laughs> move this guy had no concept was of that television. the first one <laughs> i think it was the first one but now the, i think they understand perfectly well and they also understand that their audience which is chiefly a fox so, sort of audience isn't going to care if they're caught in a hypocritical situation. Ted Cruz is their guy. Rand Paul is their guy. But Joe Biden, not their guy. So it really doesn't matter when they're hypocritical, when they're caught in the most flagrant situations because they know their audience doesn't care. Their audience being voters and beyond. So as a, as a reporter, as a journalist, I don't know if you've ever done that type of news, but why doesn't one of the reporters in the pool just raise their hand and say, wait, wait, excuse me. You just did, like they never call them out directly on the hypocrisy or on the lie. Why, why is that? Why, a reporter, why do reporters not hit them with a direct question like you, a month ago you said or a month ago you did? Why is that? They do. You may not see it on television or hear it on the radio, but they do. And the politicians usually have a ready answer, which is not responsive to the question. So then you think... Am I even going to use this? Am I going to use airtime for it? Also, reporters may get very limited time with a figure like Ted Cruz, and they may want to know, why are you holding up 
the nominations for 30 or 40 diplomats, you know, um, um, ambassadors in the Biden administration. And they want to use their time for that rather than a hypocritical situation where you know you're not going to get a confession. A lot of people think that if you just ask the question long enough, they're going to fall to their knees and say, oh, God, you got me. Oh, man, I messed up. I'm so hypocritical. I'm leaving Congress right now. That's not going to happen. <laughs> there's no shame there. there I there's don't think just so. none. I don't think so. And, it's, and, and here's where one of the many inequalities of Republicans and Democrats in terms not only of covering them, but how they comport themselves. I mean, Democrats speak in footnotes and Republicans speak in bumper stickers. And so if you're, <laughs> if you're trying to get answers to things, you have to realize that it's no longer apples and apples anymore. It's right. apples and oranges. And to deal with that as a journalist is really difficult. Because if you're asking the same question of a Democrat and a Republican, the Democrat is going to say, well, on page 143 of the bill that we put through, you can see that. And the Republican's going to say, sky is blue. Who says sky is blue? You know, prove to me that the sky is blue. That's really hard to cover. I, I love that, though. I've never heard, that, never heard it put so succinctly. And that is absolutely true. One will say nothing in three words, but have you cheering and the other will bore you to death with details. That and you, you completely just, agree with. Yeah, but you're like, can we get to a point? I always said that the, the Democrats need better writers. Like, like the big example, I think, was defund the police. It's like, could you have come up with a worse slogan for a good idea? Absolutely. <laughs> and my, and I, in fact, I, I gave this to Bill Bratton, our former police chief, and a couple other people. I said it should be detox the police, not defund yeah, the police. Yeah, that'd be good. It's catchy. It's short, but defund was the one that caught on. And and again, well, it caught on because the Republicans used it as a talking point to, to remind you that the people were, whoever they are, were coming to your house to rob you and there would be no police to call because they were, but it, but it was, that was amazing to me. That one, it was like, you got to hire somebody. You got to have someone who can write, right? Who, who can write, not term papers, but <laughs> comedy. Anyway, yeah, just, it's the same just, thing. Bang, bang, bang. Hit us with a, a quick solution. So so on that, on the um, talking about being a reporter and being press, and I do want to go into the history of L.A. because I, I love the fact you talk about our fair city because so many people hate L.A., right? It's so easy to hate L.A., easy and I think hate. you love it. It's like that shampoo <laughs> commercial from years ago, Don't Hate Me Because I'm Beautiful. Yeah. That's yeah. L.A. <laughs> But getting back to the news, what is news, what reporters are, and so on. We were talking about this off air. I want to talk about it now. So Alex Jones says that Joe Biden has a tornado machine. He, I don't know when he built it. I don't know if he built it in his spare time or, you know, maybe while, maybe while Barack Obama was. He does Obama have a big was, basement was, in that house of his. <laughs> it could be. I, maybe while Barack Obama was creating the coronavirus, Joe was working on this tornado machine. I'm really not sure. But how is this covered to the sense that we all knew about it? You, me, and, and Aaron, our engineer. Like, to me, this should be something on a tabloid that you're when you're at the cashier line at the grocery store and it's like a, you know, a headline on it used to be the Inquirer or the Weekly World News or whatever, and president has tornado machine. But no, this is covered to the point where people know, they hear this. What, what happened, Pat? What what happened? Yeah, why isn't it in the same category as Elvis Alien Baby? Right? right, right. Well, here you have in Alex Jones a public figure who had put himself front and center. The first thing I remember hearing about him was at Newtown when he denied that there were right. children who had died, that those right. children never existed, that these mm -hmm. people were tragedy actors. And yet because he's stayed in the public consciousness and because he is that most extreme element of the extreme right, I think that some news agencies have used him as kind of a straw man. Let's put Alex Jones out there because he says the craziest things. And before with the supermarket market tabloids, you bought one of those and somebody knew that you bought a supermarket tabloid. That's how the money was made. Now we have people and organizations calling themselves news on the internet, which probably aren't really news, and they survived by clicks. For years, people have said, oh, you just did that to sell newspapers. 95% of all newspapers are sold by subscription. People are getting it on their lawns, whether, mm -hmm. you know, whether they're looking at the headlines or not. But I think because you have so much now driven by clicks that 
Alex Jones will get more clicks than what we were just talking about, which is page 183 of the Build Back Better thing, which says that, oh, by the way, you know, you're going to get a free house. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, and yes, that somehow gets ex- obscured. But I think it's just so tantalizing and it's easy. The, the important stories are not easy to cover. They're investigative. They take time. They take thought. Putting, putting Alex Jones out there, man, that's easy. You get the eyeballs just pronto on something like that. So where do you get news? Um, I get my news from the major newspapers, mm-hmm. as you would expect. Um, I follow Twitter to see if there's anything I missed because I love seeing you on Twitter, among other things. <laughs> well, then you must not like airlines. <laughs> people people have pointed out that I have a problem with airlines, and I and I do. Their service is just, it's beyond horrible. Well, you have kind of <laughs> given heart to everybody who wants to say exactly what you have been saying about the airlines and right. just doesn't have the nerve or just doesn't get on the airline anymore because of that. Um, but I follow those. I also subscribe to and read the major regional newspapers in parts of the country that, you know, Washington and New York, they just don't care about. They don't right. follow or pay attention to. So um, uh, papers in, say, North Carolina or Atlanta or uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul or Salt Lake or Oklahoma City, I'll buy a, a year's subscription mm-hmm. and check in with those papers because that's where the news, the, the real sense of what the country is feeling like and what the country is doing. That's where it comes from. Instead of, we've got how many hundreds of reporters covering the White House? How many hundreds of reporters covering Wall Street? If you should put them in a centrifuge and send them out across the country, I think we'd get a better sense of what the country's feeling and not be shocked, shocked every time something like January 6th, if there were ever such a thing to repeat itself, every time something like that happens. Well, you you actually brought up a good point because I don't do that. It's a great idea. I will read foreign news. I I like reading news from the UK because they or Canada because they're looking at us from the outside yeah. looking in, and the they don't. The independent in the UK is a good one for that. Right, they don't have any any uh, horse in this race, so you're not worried about oh, this is left wing or this is right wing. They're just looking at it. And saying like and going, oh, we, sh- yeah, yeah, we are. <laughs> I, I always say that the United States, we are the number one reality show in Canada. <laughs> they just look at us and they're like, "This is great. How's this going? Oh, it's not going to end well, but it's fun to watch." We, <laughs> well, having watched a a reality show in Canada, which was the Canadian Border Police, mm-hmm. and it was it was kind of sweet because it's so scaled down from all the macho intensity right. of American Border Patrol that they were looking, some guy was bringing in carpenter tools and they were afraid he was gonna set up shop and compete with Canadian carpenters, <laughs> eh? And it was just so touching and wonderful. I thought, oh my God, it feels like the 1950s and yeah, they're, leave they're, it to Beaver again. Canadians are super nice people and they can't help it. You know, it, it's the funniest stereotype and they have it for just being nice. So yes, yeah, so they're worried about carpenter tools. Meanwhile, we're we're bringing in, you know, AR-15 submachine guns and and tons of drugs and they're like we don't want you building here. We don't want you. <laughs> you know, we'll, we'll build our own kitchen cabinets. Thank you very much. <laughs> right. Who knows what and, you're going to put in them. <laughs> it it really is great. So so that that is great though. That's a great idea to read the regional papers, right? Because what they say, and this was the big thing with Donald Trump, and and I have to say that being a comedian and traveling everywhere, I used to say this to people all the time when they were all so shocked that Trump won and how could it happen, you know, in New York and California. I, I used to tell people in LA, I said, listen, as much as you love Barack Obama, that's how much Alabama hates Barack Obama. They People couldn't comprehend I think many of us can't comprehend that there's an other side. Or can't understand why it thinks it's right and isn't open to argument. Yeah. So, but that's what the other side thinks of this side, right? Right. My my only thing is, and, and my regular listeners know I say this all the time, there is a false equivalency between the left and the right. And I always say, like, Marjorie Taylor Greene and AOC are not the same. You know, AOC, she's left. Marjorie Taylor Greene has lost her mind. (laughs) If she ever had one. If she ever, and I think her and Lauren Boebert are in a competition, right? I mean, on the right wing, it seems to be what you said about Alex Jones. There seems to be a competition to see 
who can make the most outlandish statement just to get the most coverage? You'd like to think that it's like this little secret bet that they've got going that they don't really mean any of it. And it's just going to be who's going to win the bet at the end of the year and pay off and go to Vegas for a girls weekend. But it is alarming to think that not only someone like that would be elected, but that there would be people who subscribe to this, who think that this is a good idea. These these hurtful and outrageous statements that you have heard um, coming from some of the people now in Congress. You've got Paul Gozer, whose own fam- family has said over and over, don't vote for him, don't yeah. vote for mm-hmm. him. Uh, isn't that alarming enough? We all have family squabbles, but my goodness, for them to go public on something like that. When you look back, again, we talk about history, the serious people who have been in the United States Congress, who have had distant and difficult positions and positions that are antithetic to what most people would think of as as decent, right, Mm -hmm. on civil rights, on women's rights, and yet they were serious about what they did, and they didn't go off half-cocked to attack fellow members. Um, They took the job seriously, and they debated seriously, and they spoke seriously. I don't think we're seeing a lot of seriousness, a lot of gravitas coming out of some people now. It's almost a performance in Congress. I think the people who are there who are doing that work you're talking about, real work, and, and who still care about the country, who still not the not talk, but actually care about we're trying to make country better, we never hear from them. We we only hear the loudest, most ridiculous voices and we don't hear the people working. Like you you talked about caring and so you know, Rand Paul, I mean, it, this is an example where this is a guy who has voted against aid for every disaster for the past 20 years. You know, any disaster package, hurricane, uh, tornado, whatever it is. And now Kentucky, his state gets hit and he's the first one to write a letter to the president. And do you think like... Are these, are they really, is he really that unfeeling? Is he really that bad a person or is it really just politics and, and to what end? I don't know. And I think his constituents don't know, uh, but maybe even the people he works with in the Senate don't know. It's worth remembering that one of the books that matters so much to a lot of these people, and you go back to Alan Greenspan, who is the head of the Fed is that book Atlas Shrugged by Ayn Rand, which is an unreadable, what, 50,000 pages of of, um, stereotypical behavior. And that was a kind of every man for himself. Mm -hmm. And and so that's what comes into play, I think, in a lot of this thinking is that why should we do this for someone else? Whereas we all know from all of the studies, or we should know, that the rising tide can lift all boats, that when you educate a population, you benefit everybody. I mean, Elon Musk benefits from the fact that we have an educated workforce in California, that we pave roads in California with public money, not always very well, that all of these things exist in the public wheel to the benefit of private companies and private people as well. We've kind of lost sight. If you want a libertarian argument, a conservative argument for taxes and public expenditures, that's it. You may remember when Arnold Schwarzenegger complained, when I go up in the morning, you know, I have to pay to flush the toilet. And well, the reason you pay a tax to flush the toilet is so there's some place to flush it to and some place right. to clean the damn thing. Well, and water. And is, water. Is Here we are. So the, and, and again, you, you always bring up g- good ideas. And I've had this discussion with people who fight taxes, uh, public education, et cetera. And somewhere, maybe you know where, because I certainly don't, we've lost the idea of the public good. And, and actually, right now, we're dealing with it with the virus, with masks and vaccine. It's like they, they don't want you to wear a mask. No one's out to get you. There's something bigger than you. It's called society and, and science, which is real, which, again, it, it's mind boggling that people just hear a scientist and they're just like, well, no. And yeah, like, well, what do you mean? No, like. <laughs> This person's devoted their life to studying this. This is, the, uh, they're a scientist. That, it's in the name. <laughs> you know, it's like, like if LeBron James wanted to teach me to play basketball, I'd say, yeah, okay. He, I think he knows what he he's knows doing. He knows what he's doing. Like, okay, you're a scientist. You, you, you're going to explain to me. And most recently I read 
that masks work better than social distancing. There was a study done, it was by Cornell University and a German science uh, equivalent, Cornell. And they said that two people wearing masks, like we're what, three, four feet away from each other, is more effective than 10 feet of social distancing. Hmm. But people are like, well, I'm not gonna wear a mask because I'm American. And you're like, okay. <laughs> so w- the, where did the disconnect from the public good, you know, what you were talking about, we pay taxes so that we have roads, um, education, the, the, the fight against an educated populace is mind boggling. And the people who it seems could benefit the most from public education or free college fight it. They, they've talked them into fighting against it when it's your kids can't afford to go to the school that Ted Cruz or Rand Paul's or whoever's kids are going to, and you're fighting it. Where, where did the public good go? At the turn of the century, we had such, the last century, we had such confidence in public health. This was the Teddy Roosevelt era when we had the Pure Food and Drug Act. And, you know, because this stuff was killing people, you know, bad food, bad drugs, uncontrolled medicine, snake oil stuff that was being peddled from God knows where. And so the government went in and cleaned that up, the, the Pure Food Act, so you didn't have disgusting meat and, and inedible stuff being sold. And then we had the public health program in the 1920s where people went out and nurses went out and made sure that you had clean drinking water. We set up whole systems to do that. And people loved the science because they had the benefit. Now we have science where people are refusing to acknowledge the benefit. And I think somewhere along the line, too, that idea of standing up against government has become more important than anything else, than rationality, than science. That If the government says it, if anybody in authority says it, it can't be true. They're trying to put one over on me. And then you couple that with the idea that we've redefined patriotism, that it's kind of you have a gun and you shoot other people, and that's patriotic, but nothing else. You know, working together as a community is not patriotic, right? But Unless it's a militia. Unless it's a militia p- patrolling the border, right, in lieu of the border patrol. And so where did that idea begin? When did that tilt? I don't know when that happened. Everybody looks to, oh, the disillusionment of the 60s and the 70s and the oil crisis and Watergate. But I don't know when it happened. But the toll that it's taking on the country, 800,000 dead Americans, many of whom maybe would not have had to die had they been vaccinated and observe some of the basic advice of of scientists like Dr. Anthony Fauci, who gets death threats, who has to have a guard, a security guard to keep him safe, just as all the health officials and many health officials in the country are getting death threats and are saying, I'm out of here. I don't want to stay in this. They're threatening my kids. Yeah, that that part is mind boggling. Um, And I'm just keeping an eye on time because time flies when I'm having fun talking to you. Uh, do, Do my hope... And, and this is how thin the hope is. <laughs> it's the generation, generation Z and beyond that. And I, the reason I say the hope is thin is because how did we start with X? Like what kind of plan was there? Like, listen, we're going to start at X, Y, Z, and then nothing. Did, were they that sure that we're going to destroy ourselves in this? There's going to be no, Couldn't we have started at M and worked <laughs> with? But I think they are the young people and and i'm going to when i say young i'm going to say 20s and under they seem to care they seem to be engaged will they be another do you think there'll be another generation that becomes disillusioned in their 40s and and gives up or do you think that they're really going to because they're they're organized and they're smart and one of the things i love is whenever we figure out one of their social medias they develop a new one they're like all right <laughs> All right, my parents understand Snapchat. We're going to take Instagram out of here. Right? Yeah. You, oh, Instagram. <laughs> you you know, forget that. They're, Instagram they're gen- is what they ought to call it. Yeah, they're two generations ahead. But I love that because it works. It's it's almost like their communication. So what what do you think? Is that the hope? Well, they're mad at us because we didn't start at M. Because we just brought them in at X, Y, Z and justifiably do so because then they're thinking, I may not live to 40 right. to be old enough to be able to say to even to be disillusioned because it, just looking at climate change, it's one of the many considerations out there. And so I'm hoping that between the combination of that kind of fierceness and the technology that they have at their disposal and with which they're so much more comfortable than those of us who weren't born into it that something really good is going to come out of that. 
we have to relinquish the reins and let them let them do that. Yeah, we. That's such a an important point. We're not. When I say we, you and I don't have the reins. The people holding the reins are holding on for dear life. I, you know, I was just reading today about McConnell uh, saying that the these voter voter rights acts. The Democrats keep pushing voter rights because they know they're losing. They, like. And this is another one of those statements where I wish somebody would just say, are you kidding? So what you're saying is the more people that vote, the less chance you have to win. Doesn't that tell you something? But but rather than change a policy or listen to the people, he's like, well, we got to stop them from yeah. voting. <laughs> They're not campaigning on ideas anymore. No. Because the idea, well, is pretty much run dry. and There's just anger left at the bottom. There's just anger. So do you think this this next generation, how do they... How do they get rid of this generation of power? How do they get rid of, you know, and, and you know, Joe Biden himself, he's in his 70s, late 70s. Um, I think Joe Biden's a good man, but but you could say he's out of touch. I'm disappointed with this education thing where he turned his back on the student loan. You know, he kind of flipped on that one, which will be funny because the people who were against it in the first place will now say he flip flopped on the idea. And still it's, won't vote for him. <laughs> right. It's still the, now he's doing what they want. And they're still. But no, he's you, you need some of that wily element. You need the we joked about wily coyote before him, but you need kind of that <laughs> sly Nancy Pelosi. I know how to get this done um, uh, aspect in there, too. But you also need the young element of people who are saying it's time to push this agenda forward. That's why, for example, paradoxically, it was Joe Biden who pushed Barack Obama on gay marriage because he just kind of blurted it out and so right. the administration had to recalibrate. But I think when you have like people like AOC coming into Congress and you have the same thing on the right, they're pushing the right farther to its own extremes. They're saying, no, we want this to happen. This is why we're here, to see that this happens. And they're not as inclined to play the game the way that the Nancy Pelosi generation did. You don't want them to be uncooperative because then you get nothing done. But you, I think we need to raise up that generation of the new Pelosi's, you know, the new strategists who know how to do this and keep hold of what it is they wanted to change. Things have changed in this country. I mean, yeah. substantially, you know, 50 or 60 years, you got to give some points to the folks who were in Congress, who were pushing for that sort of thing. But what's the new agenda and who are the new people who are going to carry it forward is the question we need to ask ourselves and how it's going to happen. Now, we've mentioned Pelosi and McConnell, and I have a friend, and he, he would argue, he said, listen, they're like, you know, getting back to our cartoon metaphors, they're like the wolf and the sheepdog on the old Bugs Bunny commercials where they go in and they punch the clock and they fight all day and then they punch out and they go home as friends. Pelosi and McConnell keep each other working that battle and they've, they've battled through, what is it, three administrations now? They're into their fourth. He says, yeah, they're the same person. He's like, they're two sides of the same coin and they neither one... Neither one wants this fight to end. Neither one wants this partisan politics to end because it keeps them in power. What, what do you think of that? Wouldn't that be an ugly sense of takeaway from Congress that you don't want to get things done. You just want to make sure the other guy doesn't get things done. But doesn't it seem that way? It the does Republicans seem that way. have become the party of no. That's their number one idea is no to any new idea. And the Democrats, as you said, they get lost in the footnotes and details. And I, I couldn't tell you what their policy is other than no to the Republican. No is very clear. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm paraphrasing this, but years ago, William F. Buckley, who was the most um, articulate consider, uh, conservative and worth listening to for that, even if you didn't agree with his ideas, said the role of the conservative is to th stand athwart the course of history and say no. So that's been articulated out there for 50 years now. But what do you say no to and what do you give in on? And it doesn't seem like there's much giving in at this point. And years ago, I interviewed Barry Goldwater not long before he died. And he was very frustrated with just what you're talking about. He said, you know, at the end of the day, you know, we all had dinner together with our families. You know, we got we had barbecues on the weekends. You know, we we saw each other when we picked up our kids at school, and you don't have that anymore. That kind of anger that you didn't see until right before the Civil War in Congress, where mm -hmm. there was a member of Congress who was beaten nearly to death by a Southern senator with his cane because he was an anti-slavery guy. 
And I just, I hope that that's not what Congress has come to, because if Congress can't work these things out, there's no hope for the rest of us to work things out when we shoot each other over parking spaces and bumper stickers. My Lord. Yeah, it's unfortunate. So, okay, I want to shift now. And it's great you mentioned you interviewed Barry Goldwater, because that's a perfect shift. Let's get to you. (laughs) And you have talked to so many people and, and different administrations of politics, who stands out um, in your career of the people you've interviewed, who stands out and why? Wow, well, you know I love the scientists, so Carl Sagan and guys like that, you know, the big mm-hmm. thinkers have always impressed me. Um, uh, writers, Edward Albee, the playwright, um, people like that. Um, Gordon Parks, you know, the, yeah. the polymath, the photographer, director, everything else. Um, and uh, the mustache, which is just... <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> if, to anyone listening, if you don't know, Google Gordon Parks and you will see how yes, a mustache yeah, should be grown. That, it, an exceptional <laughs> mustache. Um, you know, I've, I've interviewed Supreme Court justices, Sonia Sotomayor, um, Stephen Breyer, um, Sandra Day O'Connor after she left the court. Um, I'm going for a clean sweep, so, but I, I don't think Clarence Thomas and Alito are going to return my calls here. But, um, but, but to talk to those figures and to try to elicit just in a conversational setting, what they want, what they stand for, what they believe in. Um, you know, Leonard Cohen, mm-hmm. people like that, Kenneth Branagh, uh, and just to get beyond the work that they do and to get to who they are and why that work matters to them, whatever work it is. Has anyone intimidated you that you, you, know, you were asked to interview or you asked to interview them and it was like, whoa, I can't believe I'm talking to you know, so and so. You know, like Lauren Bacall was sort of really? like that. And Lauren Bacall brought her own, this was for television, brought her own like makeup camera people. And and I don't know, the joke is that they use Vaseline on the lens, you know, for older <laughs> actors. But whatever it was, she looked about 40, but I looked about 12. So, you know, and I didn't have a problem with either one of those, frankly. And she was, it's like, this is really Lauren Bacall I'm talking to. Right. And that was fascinating. Um, but then you get you have to get past the starstruck part and say, tell me why you're here. Why are we talking? What do you yeah. want to talk about? That That's great. Now, um, moving. And, and I don't know. Are you from L.A.? Is this no, home? no, this, no. Where no, are you no. from? I was born in a place in the Midwest so small it is legally a village. <laughs> there are fewer than 2,000 people, no movie theater, no bookstore. And it's pretty much the same way. I think. <laughs> so how long have you been here? How I came here been? to college. Okay. So Barack and Obama yeah. and I both went to Occidental College. Wow. Missed him by a couple of years because I'm certain that if we had had overlap, that I and not Michelle would be the first lady <laughs> of the United States. Thank you very much. Yeah, you're probably the only woman who's ever said that. Uh. that, 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 that I hate to tell you, Pat, that line forms Damn. to the left. That um, I've been here since 1980. So I, I tell people, I've been here long enough to complain about people moving here. <laughs> that's, that's how I feel. But you are a historian of L.A. Um, in your columns. Is that Was that something they asked you to do and you researched it, or is this just something you like, the history of this city? It's, I've always liked the history of this city, partly because most people don't know about it. It's a, it's a mystery. We, you know what? Remember those magic slates we had when we were little? You'd write on them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's what L.A. does to itself. It writes a new story every few years and erases the old one. But what is underfoot, what makes us the place that we are, is really fascinating to me. I mean, we just don't spring up like a new crop of grass every year. There's something under there. And so to tell these stories and illustrate them with this great old postcard collection that I've got, uh, and to hear from people, not just old people saying, yeah, I remember that, but... You know, younger people saying, I never knew that. I want to find out more about that. To learn about their city, how things work in Los Angeles is, I think, the message of the column. Yeah, it's fantastic. It is It is fantastic. When, you, when I read the column about the stores, it was funny because I started to remember, yeah, May Company and, and Bullock's and... Like they're, they're you were just, here in '80. You're an OG as far as shopping is concerned. Yeah, but the but the idea that now they're completely gone, like because it it would seem 
that they couldn't go away. You know, that, that they would, well, some of them started in the 1800s or early 1900s, like, you know, and in the article you talked about it, like they, it was the mercantile or, you know, what they called it back then. But the idea, nobody thought May Company wasn't going to be around. Right. Forever. That, that was. And it was an L.A. specific store. Bullock's yeah. an mm-hmm. L.A. specific store. So it was like we didn't need New York. We had our own, had like, our own shopping culture here. Fashion. Yeah. Right. And then other other columns I've done, like the week of Pearl Harbor, I thought, what was the Japanese community here like before December 7th? And so I wrote about that, you know, this thriving community that had been here, you know, since the turn of the century, just so people understood that, you know, movies seem to make things appear and disappear magically, but that's not real life. And real life has more complexity and roots to it. Yeah, I joke that unfortunately we're really good at that. Like like Christmas time, like right now, you know, everyone talks about LA, you know, you can't have 80 degrees. 80 degree Christmas. I'm like, no, we make Christmas. Okay. And the the worst thing that the worst thing that can happen to our fake snow is real rain, like real (laughs) weather. We, 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 we're like, bring in the set designers. We want winter. We need Christmas. We we got Staples Center and they build a beautiful Christmas and it's snowing and there's tree and it. Oh no, there's rain. What? Damn it. <laughs> well, you know, in the classic L.A. winter look, people are bundled up in parkas and sweaters and their legs are bare and they're wearing shower sandals. Right. That is just classic <laughs> L.A. fashion, man. Or the, the mini skirt and Ugg boot. And Ugg look. boots. Yes. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's, uh... that's the summertime <laughs> flip on the whole thing, I think. So um, you you wrote a column about our transportation, about the was it about the trains? The and red car, the street the cars. Red car, that we right, used the street cars. What happened? What when did what happened? Why did that go away? Well, if you are inclined to learn your history from Who Framed Roger Rabbit, you think <laughs> it was all a big conspiracy. But that's why we have newspapers and documentaries. But this was part of the reason that it didn't survive is that it was a private system. It wasn't a government system. Oh, I didn't Henry, know that. Henry Huntington, you know, the Huntington Library mm-hmm. guy who was a great art collector and benefactor, he built this incredible system of streetcars to get people out to his property to buy his property. So towns were created at the destinations of these streetcars. It was like you were throwing city seed out the window, mm-hmm. you know, and it sprouted wherever it went because people would get out to you know, what is Reseda or someplace now and say, wow, I could work in downtown LA and still live out here, which was probably not as far as Reseda because the red car, the street car runs Mm -hmm. here. And then when he was pretty much done selling land, he sold off the track and the Southern Pacific kind of abandoned some of the lines. And even by the first world war, LA was getting into cars. People were loving those cars. Yeah. And so they tended to say, I'm going to keep my car and not take the street car again. And then cities started putting in buses, and the streetcars ran on the same streets that everything else did. So they got jammed up. They were no faster. They weren't being maintained. The only conspiracy part of this, so we're guilty for driving cars, uh, the neglect that cities didn't keep them up when they had the opportunity is also culpable. But the conspiracy part is that when a bus company, a national bus company that was funded by tire companies, by General Mm -hmm. Motors, by petroleum companies, started buying up these rights of way and these routes and then putting buses in and taking out the streetcars. And so the Fed said, this was 1947, the Fed said, oh, we don't like this. And they took them to court and they won a little and they lost a little. And the fines, you were talking General Motors, mm-hmm. Standard Oil, the total fines were $37,000. How did they make it? How, did, I how could they, they pay they, that? They had to go through their sofa cushions. <laughs> I mean, I felt so bad for them when I read that. And so, yeah, they kind of did conspire to run the buses instead of the streetcars. But there was not a lot of support for the streetcars in the end. And now we're very nostalgic about it because they had 1,200 miles of track. They ran through four counties. That's twice what Metrolink has now. Right. So uh, why did it survive in San Francisco? San Francisco, because it's physically, geographically confined. Mm -hmm. And if you got people moving around San Francisco, they can only go so far unless they want to get wet. And here, you can just keep going and going and going. And the farther you go, the more tempting your car looks, especially when all the federal money started coming in after the Second World War, and it was going to buses and roads, buses and freeways. And that's where the investment was going, not the streetcars. So now we wish we had them back. Yeah, that that's something that... um I guess everything comes full circle, right? Is that is that what they say? So, uh, doing this column about about the history of L.A. W- 
Give me some fascinating things that you learned about our city. Ooh, hmm. And and let me just say to to our listeners, and thank you for being here. You see, people, we do have a culture. See, because everyone says L.A. doesn't have a culture, C. right? L.A., do. all we do is make movies and everything is fake and this and that. And, and so I'm so glad you're here. So, yes, listeners, I'm looking at my microphone angrily. <laughs> we do have a culture, and I have the 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 person who knows it right here. I am arguing for culture in L.A. all the way. <laughs> um, when I did the, the Japanese before the Second World War, it was really interesting to find out how complex a community it was. And partly because they were excluded from so many other parts of public life, they had to develop kind of a mirror culture themselves. Doctors, lawyers, accountants, restaurants, other services were all Japanese because they couldn't, weren't allowed into the main culture. When I was writing about political corruption, we've had these spates of you know arrests and convictions in public office, um, to find out that part of the reason that our corruption isn't nearly as sexy as like Chicago corruption is because our whole government, the civic structure is built to be weak, to spread out the power. So mm-hmm. no one person can be, you know, the king of corruption. There's no daily, um, the, uh, no daily family here. Exactly. There is no daily family. And even if you tried, you couldn't raise up a daily family because there's no concentrated power. The power is dispersed sometimes very much to the bad because it means we can't get things done in Los Angeles in a big, fast way. But that's when they wrote the charter, when they wrote the state constitution, they wanted all the power spread out because they didn't trust that kind of concentrated authority. And once you know that, you start looking at how things happen in the city of L.A. and the county of L.A., and you go, well, that makes sense. Now I know why that happens or why that doesn't happen. And that is something that's different in L.A. that um, I actually don't know any place else that is like that, where we have L.A. City, L.A. to city, and L.A. County. But if you don't live here, you don't know that. And most, I think most people's impression of L.A. is actually the county and they don't understand that the city is separate. Um, why, why is that? How did that develop? Because unlike other places where you had big cities and then the suburbs um, kind of grew into the city, here we've got a, a very spread out city system, partly because we had the missions. And you look at what the missions were. They were little self-sustaining places in the 18th century. You know, they had their own tannery. They had their own creamery. They had their own whatever. And so our little city started that way. So we don't have just, we have a big downtown, but we've got downtowns in the valley. We've got downtowns on the west side. And so to understand that that is kind of the structural basis of Los Angeles really helps you to figure it out too. Yeah, that's... uh Fascinating. It, it really is. The history I've learned just reading your columns. And, and also, you know, you mentioned Twitter. Now, this is another thing that you talk about and you joke about, but you are fantastic on Twitter. Oh, thank you. Because you point out, you, you pull up stories that people may not have seen, but they should know, and you comment on them. Um, you're a real reporter. You're a real journalist and you're a thinking person. So so it's not all, like we say, it's not about flash and clicks. You still have a humanity in you that comes out on Twitter when you question some of these things. Oh, thank you. That means a lot to me. Well, it, it's thank true. It, it is true. Follow up Pat Morrison on Twitter and you will see what I mean. And, and um, I could call him up now, but we're, we're running low on time. I'm not going to bring up the tweets, but you do bring a humanity to it. Is it frustrating? Is watching what's going on locally, nationally, internationally? I mean, we didn't even get into, you know, Putin and Ukraine and and all of this. I'm invited to a wedding in Ukraine in uh, June. I don't know whether I'm going to be. We'll we'll lay some bets there and see about that. Is it frustrating? It is frustrating because especially on Twitter, you see it's so easy to retreat to your corner and just be angry about anything, no matter what corner it is. But to bring a little bit of humor and some insight into it, I think is so important because people who are on Twitter may not be reading newspapers or watching mainstream news. This may be where they get their information. So if I can give them a little opening and a little insight, say, oh, yeah, what about that? Why didn't that happen or why did that happen? I'm I'm grateful to people who follow me for doing that. Oh, I'm happy to follow you. And as, as I said to my listeners, please check out Pat Morrison on Twitter and 
I, I thank you so much for being here. I have one more question that I want to ask you. Of course. What story, what is the story you haven't covered? What story would you love to do that you haven't been able to do in your career? I want to be the first reporter to file a story with the dateline, the moon. Wow. So Elon, if you're listening, <laughs> I'll take Mars, but let's stop at the moon first. We were, we were talking about this before we went on air about Elon Musk. We cannot figure out what, you know, what's bad about being Elon Musk, right? You're, you're depending day to day, you might be the richest guy in the world, you know, why Even so though, cranky, Elon Musk? Right. That's why, the are you, why are you still? What are you still mad about? You you won, you know. You as as our engineer Aaron said, pay your taxes. You're the man of the year. The man of the year should pay taxes, like and pay real taxes. I think they said that even if he paid tax at the rate that you know working uh, Americans, average Joe, average whatever pays, it would be like four hours of his time would cover his tax bill. <laughs> <laughs> so man up, in other words. Yeah, step up. Pay, and, and then, yeah, take Pat to the moon so she can write the news from there. Dateline the moon. That, that, I wonder what, what would be the number one story on the moon. Just, uh, I can't breathe. <laughs> it's going to be, it's going to be. Or I only weigh 12 pounds. That would probably be my lead. <laughs> <laughs> the ultimate diet. Just move to the moon and you, you weigh. What, wow. Don't tell the sex in the city, people, please. <laughs> Pat, I, I cannot thank you enough. This is fantastic. So, it's so cool to be on the other side of the table with you because I've, I've seen and read so many of your stories and interviews and everything else. So to get to talk to you like this is, is very cool. And I've missed sitting down and talking to you. It's been way too long. I know. We, we, we used to do a lot of KPCC yeah. and NPR stuff we don't get to do anymore. I, I, don't, know, I don't know what even happened to it, but um, I'm still around if you ever need me. <laughs> happy to hear it and happy to be here. Thanks, Alonzo. This is Alonzo Bowden. The show is called Who's Paying Attention? Please just look up Pat Morrison. It is spelled just... It is spelled the way you think it's spelled. It with two T's. With, with two T's. Okay, so you'll find Pat. Follow her on Twitter. Read her columns. To those who say L.A. has no culture, we now have someone to battle you to show the culture of L.A. Thank you so much, Pat. Uh, I am going to be uh, off next week. There won't be a new podcast. Next week we'll run, rerun an interview from a prior uh, from my days on radio, um, we we used the KBLA interviews. Pat and I talked about radio. It was too much of a job for me. But we'll run one of those interviews. And New Year's Eve, I will be in Indianapolis at Helium Comedy Club. So check it out. Thank you again, Pat. And thank you to everyone listening. Listen, happy holidays. Merry Christmas. Happy Kwanzaa. I hope you had a happy Hanukkah. Happy whatever gets you to the mall. That's right. Malls. Yes, kids. That's where we used to shop. We used to go to the mall, to the May Company. Thank you. <laughs>